welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hey, welcome back to the Pat Flynn Show. Boy, am I excited for you to hear this one, because I've got an interview with Dr. Ed Fazer. Now, I've been wanting to talk to Dr. Fazer for a long time, because this man has played a significant role in my life. He is one of the thinkers, one of the philosophers that seriously challenged me and caused me to reconsider my entire worldview. His work that he's done on natural theology, scholastic metaphysics, philosophy of mind, challenged me so deeply and on so many levels when I first discovered it. It And it eventually, ultimately, led to me converting. It led to me not only reconsidering and reopening myself to hearing religious arguments and entertaining the religious worldview. It ultimately convinced me of it. Now, not just his work, but his work played a a very prominent role in that. So I've been wanting to chat with Dr. Fazer because of that for a while. One, just to to thank him for the work that that he's done, and I do that at the beginning of the episode. But two to talk about his experience also. So, you know, when you're talking with, with somebody like Dr. Fazer, there's a million things you, you want to talk about, but you only have limited time, so you, you have to pick and choose. And I figure he's done enough interviews and talks, and he's written enough books that you can go there to dive into his arguments and his work, and you'll have a one-hour podcast. So what I wanted to do instead was focus mostly, not entirely, but mostly on his own. Uh, experience and conversion because he spent many years as an atheistic philosopher and then by studying natural theology and the arguments for God, uh, specifically Thomas Aquinas, ultimately became convinced that the more he, he looked into these arguments and learned about them and read the contemporary thinkers and writers, the more he came to see that not only were these good arguments, but they were actually successful and often grossly misunderstood by most people, including most philosophers. So his story is really fascinating, and I think you're I think you're going to get a lot out of it. Um, what I will do is I will link to his his books, which I've recommended many times before. I, I can't recommend them enough. So perhaps you've already read a few of them, like Five Proofs for the Existence of God or The Last Superstition. If so, then I think you're going to enjoy this interview all the much. A few talks that he's he's done and a few interviews he's given. He was recently on the, the Ben Shapiro show too and gave a really nice um, and succinct um, interview there and summary of of, I believe, two of the arguments that he presents in Five Proofs. But I wanted to focus a little bit more on the personal side and and hear a little bit more of Dr. Fazer's uh, own conversion and own story. So I hope you enjoy this. I I really did. I hope you get a lot out of it. And I really do hope that you go and, and grab some of his material because he's got a very special gift. He's not only a great philosopher. He's not only a great thinker. He's an awesome writer. He's, he's so clear He's entertaining. He's actually really enjoyable to read. And that's a rare combination. Talk about generalism, right? Anyways, I'll be quiet now. We'll cue the uh, cool Tom Cruise sounding intro here, and then you'll be hearing my interview with Dr. Ed Fazer. Enjoy. Ready to become better than most people at most things? Ready to become better than most people at most things? Welcome to the Pat Flynn Show. Best-selling author, entrepreneur, fitness expert, and philosopher, Pat Flynn, teaches you how to learn and become amazing at almost everything through the concept of generalism, acquiring and stacking skills that will help you dominate in business and life. Want to get in shape? Write a book? Be a better precog division officer? Or simply launch a successful business empire? Well, sit back, relax. And listen as Pat and his guests offer digestible and entertaining insights on how to learn the skills, tactics, and strategies you need to pursue your goals and achieve the life you've always wanted. Well, everybody, welcome back. I am really glad to be talking with Dr. Ed Fazer today. Uh, Dr. Fazer, I didn't get to tell you this, but I might as well start start off with at least a little bit of flattery. But your work was uh, greatly significant, a little bit of flattery. But your work was uh, greatly significant to me, and I can say you're, you're, you're certainly a person who has, uh, in the course of my life, not only challenged my views, uh, but caused me to reconsider and change many of my views. Uh, my brief background before we get into your story, because I'm sure my audience is sick of, of hearing mine, is uh, I was 
very much not a religious person, would have considered myself an atheist for many years, and then coming across work like yours and some of it exactly yours uh, began to change my perspective on a lot of things. So uh, just personally, I'm, I'm very excited to be talking to you, and thanks for making the time to come on. Well, that's very gratifying. I really appreciate that. And um, any, uh, believe me, any academic philosopher is thrilled to hear that somebody other than uh, somebody other than my mom, you know, has been uh, has been influenced uh, by anything I've written. So uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, and and on many levels too. So starting with a lot, you know, your book uh, Aquinas and your in natural theology, but then picking up your um, scholastic metaphysics and helping to understand, understand the scholastic tradition really um, caused me to appreciate the deep intellectual truth of Catholicism uh, so much so that it actually got confirmed uh, at last Pentecost. So you've moved me along on multiple huh. levels. <laughs> well, that's, that's great. That's very gratifying. I appreciate it. And that, that of course is what I'm aiming to do with the book is to, uh, is to, I, I mean, you know, talk about making a difference is kind of a cliche, but that, that is the intention. So it's, yeah, I'm glad to hear that, uh, that, uh, it's bearing fruit. Mm-hmm. So let's shift now to something much more and important and interesting, which is your story, because you have a very interesting background yourself. So if you wouldn't mind, before we get into mm-hmm. uh, some of your work specifically, would you mind just, uh, kind of catching people up, um, with the, not only the work, yeah. you do, but where you, where you've come? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, I was uh, I was raised Catholic, and I was you know sort of nominally where you've come. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I was uh, I was raised Catholic, and I was you know sort of nominally Catholic and nominally religious through my teenage years. And when I was a teenager, uh, I was I was made acquainted uh, with uh, some of the sort of standard Protestant criticisms of Catholicism, which led me away from that. But then by the time I got into uh, high school, I'm sorry, by the time I got into college after high school. Um, I not only started questioning Catholicism specifically, but just religion in general. And I became a philosophy major and was reading all the things that a, a young philosophy major would start reading by way of criticism of religion and criticism of the arguments for God's existence. And I got really into uh, writers like Nietzsche and David Hume and Bertrand Russell and a lot of contemporary uh, uh, academic atheist writers. So... Um, by the time I was, you know, I would say a year or two into my uh, time as, a, as an undergraduate philosophy major, I, and I stayed an atheist for about 10 years or so, roughly the decade of the 1990s. And it was during the latter time of uh, that decade, the late 90s, when I was a graduate student in philosophy, and I was given an opportunity to teach courses on my own. This is pretty standard. And if you're a grad student, you know, after you advance to candidacy and you're writing your dissertation, mm-hmm. they give you a chance to... Uh, either be a teacher's assistant or even to teach classes on your own. So I was doing that. And <clears throat> I always thought that um, if you're going to teach students who might never take another philosophy class, they may only take an intro class once, and that's their that's their shot, you know, to, to get a sense of what philosophy is all about. Well, I always thought that it's, it's good to um, focus on topics that are going to be of interest, not only to the academic, but to anybody. And questions about uh, arguments for God's existence and other questions related to religion are good a uh, good way to do that because everybody's interested in the question of whether God exists, even if they end up being an atheist. I'm going to spend, you know, a third of the class, the intro to philosophy class on that topic. So I started teaching uh, Thomas Aquinas and Leibniz and a lot of these old uh, uh, writers and arguments for uh, God's existence. And I did so the way that a lot of uh, atheists would, uh, the way a Richard Dawkins would say. I mean, I wasn't as obnoxious as Dawkins is in the classroom. <laughs> that, 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 that would be hard to beat, yeah. Yeah, I would, and it wouldn't be an appropriate place for that. But, but nevertheless, I was I was pretty negative about the the arguments, and it just it just became boring because the way the arguments are offered presented is as if they commit obvious fallacies that a five year old kid could point out. You know, people mm-hmm. say things like, "Well, th- doesn't the first cause argument say that everything has a cause, and if and therefore the universe has a cause, namely God?" And isn't the obvious retort to that, "Well, if everything has a cause, then what caused God?" And if you say nothing caused God, then why not say nothing caused the universe either, right? Mm-hmm. So it is that kind of simple-minded objection that I was a cause, then what caused God? And if you say nothing caused God, then why not say nothing caused the universe either, right? Mm-hmm. So it is that kind of simple-minded objection that I was uh, raising against the arguments like so many atheist uh, philosophy professors do. And as I say, it got boring. It just, you know, it didn't convey to students why philosophy was significant. 
and why these thinkers like Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle and Leibniz and St. Anselm and so forth, who uh, everybody agrees were smart guys, it didn't give the students any sense of why would these guys have ever believed these arguments, you know? So mm-hmm. I thought, okay, well, I'm going to try to make this um, more interesting for the students. And I'm going to try to revisit the literature on these arguments and see what um, historians of philosophy tell us about how these thinkers of the past actually understood their own arguments and how defenders of the argument, of the arguments would respond to some of these objections. So uh, this was all by way of making my lectures more interesting mm-hmm. and And so a lot of this material started ending up in my lectures, and the the more I studied it, the more I realized that the standard atheist um, criticisms of the arguments were really superficial. They were aimed at straw men. They were aimed at caricatures of the argument, and they just basically misunderstood a lot of the background assumptions that people like Aquinas and Aristotle and Leibniz were working with. So I, I was, you know, as, as time went on and as I was teaching the material and trying to make it more interesting for my students, even though I was still an atheist at the time, I went from thinking, well, these arguments are really stupid and a five-year-old kid could refute them to thinking, well, actually, there are a few moves you could make to try to defend them, you know, even if at the end of the day, they still don't work. And then that gradually, as I got deeper into the subject, that morphed into thinking, well, you know, actually, these arguments are kind of interesting. They're, they're kind of clever, clever that I'd given, than I'd given them credit for. And then that, as the years went on, morphed into, you know, the attitude that, you know, these arguments are actually really challenging and they're, they're getting at something philosophically deep and interesting. And finally, convinced, you know what, these arguments actually are, are right. And I'd been mistaken all along, and I had misunderstood them. And, and uh, most a- academic philosophers even, who don't, at least those who don't specialize in the subject um, of philosophy of religion, also, I realized, uh, came to realize, misunderstood them as well. So by around 2001, I had, just by way of teaching this stuff and, and deepening my understanding of it so that I could help other people to understand it, I ended up kind of reconverting myself and uh, returning to uh, belief in God. And then also to Catholicism, that's a, that's a much bigger story. Um, but, but that involved the same kind of thing as I was starting to rethink things and try to see how anybody could defend these ideas that I, that I used to think were indefensible. So if you, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to stay on the personal note for a while because that's such yeah. a, that's such a powerful sure. story. And then we can dig into some, <laughs> some of these arguments. Because, you know, one of the, the common things that, that you'll hear, and certainly this was something I thought myself, and I make that move after that, where somebody will concede, okay, yeah, all right, this, that, 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 may, that makes sense. I believe, you know, what you say, God exists, but that doesn't prove that the God of the Bible is true or that the God yeah, of Christianity right. is true. So for you personally, um, what was that? Uh, was it a pretty swift transition back to the Catholic Church or that, was it gradual? What did that look like for you? It was it was gradual, mm-hmm. and um, you know was, there there are a number of parts of the story, but part of it involved this that you know as, as I got interested in the purely philosophical arguments, the purely philosophical arguments for the existence of God, for example, and arguments for the immortality of the soul, and for the conclusion that the human mind cannot be reduced to matter, and so forth. That was another part of what was going on here in my own philosophical thinking. Well, I I gradually arrived at at the conclusion that the traditional uh, view of Western philosophers, going back to Plato and Aristotle, matter and so forth, that was another part of what was going on here in my own philosophical thinking. Well, I, I gradually arrived at at the conclusion that the traditional uh, view of Western philosophers, going back to Plato and Aristotle, who were obviously pagan philosophers, they were you know they were pre-Christian, they were pre-Judaism, pre-Islam, um, or, or they you know they're around around the same time as Judaism was getting going, but, but before those other thinkers, so they, before those other religions. So they, they didn't have any ax to grind from a Christian, Jewish, or Muslim point of view. Mm-hmm. But from those thinkers onward, you know, the standard view of, of uh, Western philosophers had been that the existence of God and the immortality of the soul could be demonstrated through purely rational arguments. And the more I studied this stuff, the more I came to conclude that, yeah, you know, these guys are correct. But you also end up with a very specific conception of God's nature and of the nature of human beings by way of those purely philosophical arguments. For example, those arguments from the world. Mm -hmm. So that rules out pantheism, for example. That tells you that if any of the world religions are true, it's going to be, it's not going to be one of the pantheistic religions, meaning one of the religions that says that God and the world are really the same thing. So that ruled out for me religions like Hinduism, for example, which at least in, in its best known versions is pantheistic. 
And then the same thing with the arguments for the immortality of the soul. The idea is that all these philosophical arguments were kind of pointing me in the direction of the conclusion that if any of the world religions is true, and for a while I wasn't convinced that any of them was, but if any of them is true, it's going to have to be uh, one of the religions that uh, that insists on a radical distinction of between God and the world, and that God created the world out of nothing, and that human beings have an eternal destiny after this life, and they that they are must be you know the human soul must be specially created by God with each new human being and so forth, and they're only that they are must be you know the human soul must be specially created by God with each new human being and so forth. And there are only, really only a handful of religions that are really consistent with those philosophical conclusions, and they're Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, basically. So the, just the philosophical arguments narrowed it down uh, pretty um, considerably for me. But of course, that still you know, leaves you with the question, well, are any of those religions true? Maybe they're consistent with what we can know through philosophy, but that doesn't mean they're true. How do we know that they're actually true and not just consistent with what we know through philosophy? And in the case of Christianity, there are a number of reasons why I was drawn to Christianity rather than the, than the alternatives. But in the cr- case of Christianity, Christianity, more than any other religion, hinges everything on uh, uh, a claim to a miracle. I mean, in particular, the, the resurrection of, of Christ. The idea, going back to St. Paul, is that, look, a miracle. I mean, in particular, the, the resurrection of, of Christ. The idea, going back to St. Paul, is that, look, if if, if you're going to know that this religion is true, it's going to have to be backed up by a miracle because it's a it's what uh, theologians call a revealed religion. The claim is that there's certain truths of the religion that they're divinely revealed. You don't get at them just through philosophy. They have to be specially revealed by God through a prophet. And how do you know the prophet is not just making stuff up? That's got to be backed by a miracle. It's got to be backed by some event that could not have happened, even in theory, um, apart from special divine action. So the truth of any of these religions is also going to be a hint, is going to hinge on some dramatic uh, miraculous event. And of the three, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, only Christianity explicitly hinges its truth on a very dramatic miracle claim, namely the resurrection of, of Christ. So um, it, it, it you know to line. And so the question is, did the resurrection really occur? Now, now that's a big um, that's a big topic all its own. But the main objections to the historical evidence for the for the resurrection, uh, I concluded, were they really all presupposed a naturalistic view of the world? That is to say, they presuppose a world a view of the world according to which there is no God, there is no immortal soul, the world is kind of on autopilot, just bops along according to the laws of nature. And if you take that for granted, if you take that assumption for granted, and then you try to give an argument for the resurrection then the argument's not going to be very powerful because the skeptic can always say, well, even if I can't explain the, the evidence of the resurrection, the empty tomb and the willingness of the earliest apostles to die for their claim that Christ had been resurrected, all that kind of stuff, the skeptic can always say, well, even if I can't explain that, I know there must be some naturalistic explanation because I already know independently that the natural world is all there is and so forth. So that kind of blocks the arguments from even getting out of the gate. But if you don't have that naturalistic assumption in place, if instead you've already independently been able to, to, to show through philosophical arguments that God exists, that there's, there's a name of the soul that survives the death and destruction of the body and so forth, you've already got that independently argued for, then the, the evidence for the resurrection takes on a whole different complexion. Uh, because now you already know there's a God who could cause such a thing to occur. You already know that there's an aspect of human nature, namely the soul, that can survive the death of the body, so that the human being could come back into existence if God reunited that that uh, soul with its body and so forth. Then the evidence for the resurrection, uh, I judge, look, starts to look very powerful. And uh, so gradually, I, you know, as I was reading people like William Lane Craig and others who defended the, the resurrection, but where I'd already concluded that you could independently prove the existence of God and the immortality of the soul and that kind of thing, uh, I became convinced that the resurrection had occurred. So that brought me to Christianity specifically. Yeah. And then there's, you know, a whole lot of other factors that brought me to Catholicism specifically, but that's kind of the, those are some of the main, um, the main uh, trends of thought that actually was not aware of that side of your story before. So that was, uh, that was really cool to hear. Funny that you brought up um, Dr. Craig um, because obviously I, I, I 
admire his work. It was influential on, on me as well. But I just recently watched a, a panel of him attacking divine simplicity. So you guys obviously wouldn't agree yeah. on everything at this point. <laughs> but, no, no. But, but maybe- In fact, I, 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 I told him once, I said, I said, you know, it's, it's really ironic that you're so hard on Thomas Aquinas and on divine simplicity, because I said, your work, you know, Craig's work on the cosmological argument and, and some of what he'd written on Thomas Aquinas, I said, it, it actually helped move me in the direction of, uh, of Aquinas. And he said, he sort of pretended to be uh, disappointed and said, oh, my, I guess my exposition of Aquinas was too sympathetic, right? I don't know, with a twinkle in his eye. I mean, he wasn't really, but um, so, you know, he's, he's interested in Aquinas. He's interested in traditional theological ideas like divine simplicity, but but yeah, he ends up sort of not going all the way for that, sort of not going all the way for that the way I eventually did. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, um, nobody's perfect is all I can say. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you'd say the same about me. So, Well, this is a good opportunity because a lot of the arguments that you give – uh, like you said, they they can not only establish the existence of God, but they can t- they can tell us some very specific things about the nature of God as well. So, what do you say we uh, roll up our sleeves here and we'll make no you know make sure. no assumptions? Maybe it's the uh, the first time that anybody will be exposed to this 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 type of argument. The first time anybody's hearing of um, well, you tell me, uh, Doctor Fazer, what's what would you start somebody with? Is it the Aristotelian proof? I know that's the first one in, in your book, and and how would you present it? Um, say you were. Again, we're right back in that intro to philosophy class. How would you present it these days? Yeah, so um, my book, Five Proofs of the Existence of God, there are five lines of argument for God's existence that I develop and defend there at length. And as you say, the first of them, Aristotle, and the basic ideas go back to Aristotle and to followers of Aristotle like Thomas Aquinas and Moses Maimonides and people like that. But the way I present it is not exactly their way. I try to present it in a more modernized uh, form. And part of the point of that was that I didn't want to get bogged down into trying to to do exegesis of texts from Aristotle and Aquinas. And Mm -hmm. some people are interested in that kind of thing, but for other people, it's tedious. And so I I find it a distraction in in some context. So I wanted to write a book that didn't do it that way. So that argument, which was one of uh, of two main arguments that that were crucial to my coming back to theism, the other one being uh, the argument of from the principle of sufficient reason for a necessary being that, that you see in Leibniz and Samuel Clark. And that's a lot of jargon your listeners might not know about. So we can come back to that if you want. But um, those two arguments, the, the Leibniz style argument and the Aristotle Aquinas sort of argument were the main ones that, that gradually led me about. So we can come back to that if you want. But um, those two arguments, the, the Leibniz style argument and the Aristotle Aquinas sort of argument were the main ones that, that gradually led me back to, to theism. Or mm-hmm. belief in God. So, in the case of the Aristotelian argument, if I can, you know, I, I guess I can try to give it a, uh, a a very simple, brief summary. And naturally, you know, any philosopher wants to say, uh, you know, I I spell this out at thirty pages, forty pages in the book. So, see the book for the details. It's true. Um, I'll attest the, to it. <laughs> the the argument when spelled out is is you know more sophisticated and complex than I can summarize in a minute. But the basic idea is that. The argument starts out from the fact that we know from the five senses that change occurs. It's often called the argument from change. So the coffee, I've got a coffee cup nearby here, and the the coffee has gone from being hot to being uh, lukewarm. And there's a light on my desk here, and it went, it was off earlier this morning, and then I desk here, and it went, it was off earlier this morning, and then I turned it on. And the room has grown uh, colder, and so on and so forth. So these are all examples of change. And then as Aristotle and Aquinas argue, for change to occur is essentially for things to go from potential to actual. The coffee goes from being potentially cold to being actually cold. The light goes from being potentially on to being actually on. And in general, change of any kind involves going from actual to potential. So how does that ever happen? Well, for something to go from actual, from potential to actual, I should say, there's got to be something already actual that makes that happen. Like the air in the room is already cool. And that actualizes the coffee's potential to become cooled down and so forth. So we've got change, which involves things going from potential to actual. The way that works is something already actual makes that happen, actualizes the potential of a thing. And then that thing in turn might be going from potential to actual because some other thing is causing actualizing another, which actualizes another. But there, there are two different kinds of series of causes and effects. Some of them work forward and backward in time. 
So the coffee is there on my, uh, on the desk and it's there on the desk because I put it there a few minutes ago and it's, it's, you know, I put it there a few minutes ago because I'd previously been in the kitchen making the coffee and we've got a series of causes and effects going backward into the past. Mm -hmm. And then you might ask whether there's a beginning in the past and so forth. But that's not the kind of cause and effect series Aristotle and Aquinas care about. That, that's what's called a, by philosophers, sometimes called a linear series of causes, like a straight line ordered in time, going forward and backward in time. But what they're interested in, not that kind of series, but rather what's sometimes called a hierarchical series, which involves a series of causes and effects all existing at a single moment or snapshot of time. Think of the way that the, there's a stack of books on my desk right now, and those books are held up here and now because there's a desk under the way that the, there's a stack of books on my desk right now, and those books are held up here and now because there's a desk under them holding them up here and now. And at the very moment here and now when the desk is holding them up, the desk is in turn being held up by the floor, and the floor is in turn here and now being held up by the ground and so forth. So that would be an example of what's called a hierarchical series, mm -hmm. one thing being caused by another being caused by another here and now simultaneously. Now, when you put all this stuff together and you spell the argument out in detail, the idea is this, that things can change here and now only because they actually exist here and now. And so the coffee in my cup, which is growing colder uh, uh, at any particular moment, it can only grow colder because it exists here and now. But that's true only because the water that makes partially makes up the coffee exists here and now. But that in turn is true only because here and now, the uh, atoms that make up the water molecules their potential to be water molecules is actualized here and now. You know, they're not some other kind of molecule. They're water molecules dependent on subatomic particles here and now being actualized to form atoms in the first place rather than some other, and the kind of atoms that they form, hydrogen and oxygen, rather than some other kind of atoms and so forth. And so we've got a series of causes here and now where one level of reality is actualized by another level of reality here and now, which is actualized by another here and now and so forth. And the idea is that the only way all this can exist here and now is if there's something outside the series that actualizes the whole series here and now without itself being actualized. Mm -hmm. And that's what I call in the book, I use the technical label, a purely actual actualizer. It actualizes everything here and now without itself being actualized because it's already fully or entirely or purely actual. And that's essentially what Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas call the unmoved mover. They, uh, or God, they really mean the unactualized actualizer. It actualizes everything else without having to be actualized or caused because it's already fully actual. There's no, uh, or God, they really mean the unactualized actualizer. It actualizes everything else without having to be actualized or caused because it's already fully actual. There's no potential in it that needs to be actualized. Mm. Now, that's more than a minute, I realize, sorry. Well, I was going to say, it was, it, was it was extremely <laughs> well rehearsed. It's almost like you've presented that before. <laughs> I, yeah, I presented it two or three times, and uh, you know, you get a philosopher talking, and you you don't interrupt. You, he's going to go on. So I'm sorry, um, but and it's also very abstract. But as I show in the book, when when you start unpacking the idea, okay, but what is it to be a, a fully actual thing? What is it to be an unmoved mover? You you can show through philosophical arguments that anything that's like that is going to have to be outside the material world, outside of time and space. It's going to have to be infinite in power. It's going to have to be something that never comes into being or passes away. And it's also going to have to be something that has something like intellect, something like a mind and something conceived, at least of the God of the philosophers, to use the phrase that you, that you referred to uh, earlier. And then where you can show each, you can show all this by rigorous step-by-step -step arguments for each of the traditional divine attributes, as they're called, the, the attributes that are definitive of God. And simplicity is, is one of them. And I know you dedicate some, eight, I think it's around 80 pages in the book to, to yeah. just the divine attributes. So I'm going to highly yeah. encourage that, that people not only pick up the book, but spend the time reading that. Because I, I certainly don't want to sit here and make you defend all of those steps right now. <laughs> just, you've, you, and I'll link to, um, you've had a lot of really great interviews and discussions recently too, in, including on Ben Shapiro. So I'll be sure I, I link that as well. But here's here's a question just because I'm going to be selfish and just from my own curiosity. Uh, Dr. Fazer is what I like about what you've done um, is is you've not only held on to but you have um, defended the sort of uh, well the scholastic metaphysics the potentiality and actuality and I guess my and I guess my 
my question is, why, why did you want to do that, aside from maybe, of course, thinking that it's true and important, uh, as opposed to giving a more contemporary version of this argument that maybe uses different language? For example, I just um, got done talking with Father Robert Spitzer, who sent me his 40-page essay on a contingency-like argument that just uh, it makes the, the argument, say, from conditioned realities and how there must be one conditioned reality. So my question for you is, yeah, um, yeah so, so why... Um, why resist the temptation to put it in more contemporary language, so to speak, for, for your presentation? Yeah. Well, the reason for that is that, <laughs> in, my opi- in my opinion, you, you can't really understand fully the, uh, the traditional arguments for God's existence in Western philosophy, by which I mean the arguments that have their origins in Plato and Aristotle and were hammered out in, in rigorous detail by the scholastic tradition in the Middle Ages, out in, in rigorous detail by the scholastic tradition in the Middle Ages, and then some of the main themes picked up by early modern thinkers like Leibniz as well. So you have this long tradition that goes back 2,500 years almost to ancient Greece and continues through the Middle Ages and still has its defenders today. You can't really understand that whole body of argumentation without understanding the larger philosophical context in which it's embedded, because these guys had a fully worked out theory of how cause and effect work, how cause and effect works of how, of what it is to be a physical object and so on and so forth. They have a whole, you know, what philosophers call a metaphysical view of the world that is, that is intended to be something that's deeper than science, that science fills natural science, physics, chemistry, and so forth, fill in all the details but what they're really doing is putting flesh on a skeleton, and the skeleton is what metaphysics gives you. It addresses questions like, what is it to be a cause or an effect in the first place? What is it? I mean, you might have a kind of a superficial understanding of them, but a really deep understanding, and specifically an understanding that shows why the stock objections all fail and why they're superficial. You can't really have that without understanding that larger context. And so there, there are some readers who don't need that larger context, and that's totally fine. But nevertheless, there are always going to be some readers who want to take things down deeper. They want to dig deeper into the, you know, the, 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 the most general principles that, uh, of philosophy that, that govern all reality. And it's only in light of those that you're really going to have the deepest understanding of these arguments for God's existence and, and see, again, where the, a lot of the, the stock objections to the arguments from uh, the atheist quarter, where they go wrong. Yeah. And, so, the, the, so I... You know, as I was working on um, the first book where I set all this out, The Last Superstition, you know, now 11 years ago is when that came out. Initially, I thought, well, maybe I won't have to get into all this Aristotle and, and Plotinus. And now 11 years ago is when that came out. Initially, I thought, well, maybe I won't have to get into all this Aristotle and, and Plotinus and Thomas Aquinas stuff. But the, the more I worked on it, the more I realized, no, I really, I really can and ought to do that because – you know, people really need a, a, a philosophically deep presentation, understanding these arguments. There's enough stuff out there that's that's popular, you know. Mm-hmm. And while some of my some of my work is semi popular, I, I think you know, I, I mean, people have told me this for ten years now. Even the semi popular stuff tends to be more philosophically difficult and rigorous than than a lot of other popular stuff. I, I try to do it in a way that sort of gently eases the reader into it. So I think for an interested reader, it's not going to be overwhelming. But, I, you know, I try to take things to a deeper level because I think you're not, you're not going to fully understand the arguments unless that's done. Yeah, and, and the nice thing about Five Proofs and the other books you've written is, is there's a convergence as you, as you go through the book. There's a synthesis to, um, to unpack that. So you mentioned some common objections and how they go wrong and, and how we can respond to those by understanding some of these deeper metaphysical principles. Do you... Uh, Mind uh, sharing a few? Sure. So I alluded to one of them. It's, it's, it's become my. It's become something of my pet peeve. You know this this tired objection. If everything has a cause, what caused God, and so forth. And um, it's hard even for me to rehearse the objection without sort of lapsing into my dumb guy voice. <laughs> <laughs> everything has a cause. What caused God? You know. That's and how I read every internet comment that says that. In exactly. <laughs> that yep. Well, that's right. You you can't read a lot of internet com boxes without. That, that voice of entering your mind, you know, mm-hmm. but the, so, so that objection I find no matter how carefully and thoroughly you explain what's wrong with it, there's certain people who just, it's like, they can't help themselves. They're addicted to it. They keep <laughs> lapsing into it. It's become such a, such an urban legend, such a, 
you know, it's like they can't help themselves. They're addicted to it. They keep <laughs> lapsing into it. It's become such a, such an urban legend, such a, you know, uh, such a stock move that, that even people who at least at first seem to realize that it's not all that it's cracked up to be, you know, a week later, they'll fall, they'll find themselves lapsing back into it. Like, like an alcoholic reaching for that drink again after he's been dry for a month, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's a good um, analogy for it. And so, so what's, what's wrong with the objection is that, I mean, there are a few things wrong with it, but the idea that the first cause argument for God's existence says that everything has a cause. So the universe has a cause. That's simply a, a complete straw man. There, there isn't any philosopher that I know of, and certainly no significant philosopher, who ever gave that lame argument. It's just a, it's just, you, and it, it's interesting as you find when atheists attack arguments for God's existence, they'll attack, say, the design argument, and they'll quote William Paley. Here's where William Paley gives, he gives the design, and then they'll go into attack it. Okay. Or they'll attack St. Anselm's ontological argument, and they'll quote a little passage from St. Anselm. Okay. But then when they say, okay, now let's attack the first cause argument, and here's how it goes. Everything has a cause, so the universe has a cause. They never cite any philosopher. I mean, they never quote a passage from any philosopher who gives that argument. And the reason they don't is that there is no philosopher who's given that <laughs> argument. I mean, you don't see anything like that in Aquinas and Leibniz and Aristotle and Plotinus and Samuel Clark. None of these guys give that dumb argument. Hmm. And yet people keep attacking it. Um, it's become, it's just kind of taken on a life of its own. And then when, when atheists do attack what, er, what Aristotle or Aquinas actually said, they often read this everything as a cause argument into it, even though it's not there. They, it's like all they can see. They've, they've like been, it's got this mental image and they can't see past it. Um, so the, these classical writers, Leibniz, Aristotle, Aquinas, and so the, these classical writers, Leibniz, Aristotle, Aquinas, and so forth, they don't say everything has a cause, the universe has a cause. In fact, not only did they not say that, they would reject the claim that everything has a cause. What they say is not that everything has a cause. What they say is instead that they're different formulations. They'll say everything that comes into being has a cause, meaning at some point it didn't exist, then it came into existence. Okay, well, that kind of thing has to have a cause. Or they might put it by saying that whatever's contingent has a cause, meaning if it's the kind of thing that exists but it didn't have to, it could have been different, then that would have to have a cause. Or my own preferred formulation would be Aquinas' uh, way of putting it, which is that whatever go anything that goes from potential to actual has something already actual that, that generates it. But that's as different from saying that everything, period, that everything has a cause, as saying that triangles have three sides is different from saying, mm -hmm. you know, if I say, if I say triangles have three sides and someone says, well, wait a sec, well, what do you mean? I mean, uh, squares don't have four sides and pentagons don't have four sides and circles don't have four sides. I'd say, well, I never said that. I never said all geometrical figures have the three sides. I said triangles do. Mm -hmm. And so in the same way, if I say that what goes from potential to actual needs a cause, that there's nothing in that implies that I'm saying everything has a cause. And so I'm not making some blanket claim and then going on to make an arbitrary exception to that claim as, as I would be if I said everything has a cause and then I, then I deny that, that, um, that God has a cause. So that's simply a straw man, and it's a, it's a very old straw man. It's, it's probably at least 100 or 150 years old. And I actually, in the book, um, I, I devote a few pages to discussing the history of that straw man argument, how it got going. And I found in, in my reading on this stuff that you'll find writers from 100 years ago complaining about it, saying, why do people keep attacking? People have fallen in love with this idea. If, if, if you're an atheist, and I, you know, I used to be an atheist, and especially in my earlier atheist days, you know, there's an attraction, you know, there's kind of a, like a, a, a sophomoric smart ass mentality that, that a young atheist tends to take on. And I, you know, I had that when I was younger and you kind of grow out of it eventually. Well, hope a lot of people seem not to, I mean, you've got a, a lot of 50 and 60 something adolescents, you know, and Richard Dawkins. Yes, I do. <laughs> you do. But, but the, the idea that you could, you could, the, the whole idea that you could take down an entire edifice of human thought that you could, that you could take down Aristotelianism, you could take down Thomas Aquinas' whole system by raising an objection that a five-year-old kid could raise, right? Everything is a cause, what cause goes. <laughs> That's so attractive to certain people. They think it's so cool. Oh, it's so cool that they, they've just fallen in love with it. And when you, when you tell them, oh, that's dumb, you're, you're, not, you're not even attacking something they even said, they just they find it hard to give it up. You know, they, they've gotten so, so cool. 
that they they've just fallen in love with it. And when you when you tell them, oh, that's dumb, you're, you're not you're not even tacking something they even said. They just they find it hard to give it up. You know, they, they've gotten so emotionally attached to that idea that they find it hard to, to to give it up. So I think I think that's part of the reason why it's a it's the straw man that won't die. It's the it's the zombie straw man argument. Yeah, it's a it's a vampire myth, and 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 every area of knowledge or or pretty much every field that you can think of has a series of these myths that just keep cropping up again and again. Where these terrible arguments, it doesn't matter how many times you refute them or how many times you respond, they're back five minutes later. And and certainly yeah. religion and natural theology is no different, huh? So, um, uh, Doctor Fazer, and I know that we're on a, a bit of a time crunch here, so I want to respect your time. Somebody's, you know, somebody's listening in and, you know, maybe they're on the fence. Maybe they're like, okay, yeah, that, that, you know, that, 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 that seems like it could make sense. Yeah, I definitely need to dive into your books and, and, and read the argument in, in fuller detail. What, you know, is looking for the best representation? And of course, we're going to link your books there um, as well. Uh, what, what types, what other argument or things should they, should they be thinking about uh, to, to, to try and get the clearest picture of what we're trying to convey in this conversation? Yeah, so uh, basically, you're asking me to to recommend the competition, right? Other writer, <laughs> other writers who, uh, which is which is totally fine, which is totally fine. Um, well, I mean, one one thing that 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 I would recommend looking at it, and it, and I'm or even make even, reference even, here too. even this actually, even this, um, because I do yeah. want to keep the focus on on your work because I think it's so good. You said you know natural theology, uh, potentiality, actually. So I will tell you that those arguments had a gradual effect on me personally. And then like you, I eventually came to see, once I understood, I'm like, oh, these are successful. But one that like got me right away that um, didn't take as much time to build was something like the categorical gap when it comes to materialism and consciousness. Like that one just smacked me in the categorical gap when it comes to materialism and consciousness. Like that one just smacked me in the face. I'm like, wow, yeah, that doesn't work. So that's kind of what I'm getting at, you know? Mm-hmm. I see. Yeah. So the, so in other words, what you're asking, what ideas, what philosophical ideas and arguments other than arguments for God's existence should people be reconsidering and, and thinking twice about yes, that kind thank of thing? Thank you for making my sentence coherent. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's totally fine. Well, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's another subject that, that actually played a, a very big role in my own move away from atheism to, uh, to theism because, uh, while I was an undergraduate, I was not only an atheist, but I was a materialist. I thought that the natural world, the material world is all that exists, and that everything in it can be explained in terms of and reduced to matter in motion. And that includes the human mind, the human intellect, and so forth. And um, But it actually, it didn't take very long, and it was, it was long before, I, it, was, it was long before I became a theist, long before I was, you know, remotely inclined to question atheism. That I came to conclude that the standard uh, arguments for materialism, the standard theories that try to reduce mind to matter, were all completely hopeless. And there were a few writers who um, influenced me in this direction. One of them was Thomas Nagel, um, who's still a very prominent uh, atheist writer, but a non-dogmatic one, and one who has gained some notoriety in recent years for challenging his, you know, the orthodoxies peddled by his fellow atheist materialists. Um, another was John Searle, who's a, think- who's a thinker cut from a similar cloth, also an atheist, but a very harsh critic of all existing uh, versions of materialism, uh, in- and especially in Searle's case, the, um, the idea that the brain is a kind of computer hardware and the mind a kind of software run on the arguments and arguments that I think are even more, uh, even deeper and more um, telling against this idea. And those those arguments had a very strong influence on me uh, early in my atheist years. I was convinced that no existing form of materialism could work, and that the, the whole idea of the mind is kind of a computer, and and the, the brain the, the brain is kind of a computer, and the mind the software on the computer. That it was ultimately really just a bad metaphor, and that philosophically it was totally incoherent. Um, but I, I was still a materialist for a while. But I, you know, I became a, a kind of agnostic materialist. I thought, well, the mind must somehow be material, but maybe our brains are just too limited in order to understand how it could be. You know, we can't really even understand the nature of our own minds, even though they're purely material. And eventually I, I gave up that view um, as, you know, I started to, to move back toward theism and so forth. Um, but yes, those arguments uh, played a big role. And I've, I've written on this subject um, at some length in theism and so forth. Uh, 
Um, but yes, those arguments uh, played a big role. And I've, I've written on this subject um, at some length at, at the level of articles and book chapters. So I, I get into this in my book, The Last Superstition. I get into this in my book on Aquinas. Um, I get into it in some essays in other places, like in my book, Neo-Scholastic Essays. Mm-hmm. Um, though I haven't yet, I was about to say I haven't yet written at book length on this. That's not quite true because one of my first books uh, called Philosophy of Mind gets into this subject in some detail and sets out some of the main objections to materialism. Um, but it's actually going to be the main theme um, of my my next book, which I hope to start working on soon. On the uh, it's going to be the ten- the working title is on the immortality of the soul, mm. and so I hope to I hope to do for that subject what Five Proofs does for the subject of arguments for God's existence. Oh wow, that'll be that'll be great. I recently <laughs> saw your um, your talk of uh, where you you were over at the you were is that right? So uh, yeah, I, I just so you know if, if any of your listeners are interested and they can they can find. Um, links to all this stuff at my website, which is just edwardfaser.com. That's Edward and then F-E-S-E-R.com. Um, yes, I did give this talk at a couple places recently, most recently at the Angelicum in Rome on the subject of the immateriality of the human intellect. And I present there, I try to do it in as simplified a way as I can. But what I take to be the, the sort of the key philosophical arguments that show that human thought, that the human intellect cannot be reduced to matter, cannot be accounted for, even in theory, just in terms of brain activity. Yeah. So anybody who's interested in hearing a kind of, you know, accessible, hopefully hour long presentation of that can find the link to that on my, uh, on my main website. Well, I guess, I guess the, the last thing that I would say is, is like, is like, why not? Right? We're, we're considering the biggest, most pressing questions of our existence. Like, why, why can't you give an hour to that? <laughs> It's amazing how many people. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> gloss that, over such. That's things. right. They no, an hour, an hour. Yeah, I can't devote an hour to the question of whether the soul. I have an immortal soul, or whether God <laughs> exists. You know, um, I, I got I got YouTube videos to watch, buddy. You know, I, I mean, seriously. You know, so um, yeah, I, 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 and I think um, I think any reader who's in, any, any listener who's interested in this kind of thing at all, uh, at least on my material, like like that particular lecture. I think they should find accessible and, and, and interesting. Yeah, d- they definitely will. So I will link that. I'll link philosophy of mind, five proofs, your website. Uh, but yeah, Dr. Faze, if you don't mind, just can you um, give your, your you know, the best ways for people to, I know you mentioned your site again, so maybe just reiterating that, the best ways to keep up with you. I know you blog a ton. It's one of my favorite blogs to read. Um, so not only some of the current stuff that people can dive into, but maybe even sooner one uh, coming possibly yeah. this month, if you don't mind mentioning those resources. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Uh, so my, my latest book, which should be out, I think it's available in Europe now. The publisher is European and, and they're just uh, shifting uh, American uh, distributor distributors. So it should be out, I think, by the end of February uh, in the United States. Um, and it's called Aristotle's Revenge. And the subtitle is The Metaphysical Foundations of Physical and Biological Science. And it's a it's a very detailed treatment. It, the book's about 500 pages long. I think it might be the longest book I've ever written, um, showing why modern natural science uh, not only does not undermine the traditional Aristotelian philosophy, but actually, at least in a very general way, presupposes the basic themes of Aristotelian philosophy. So it's essentially a synthesis of what we know from modern physics, chemistry, and biology with uh, synthesis of what we know from modern physics, chemistry, and biology with um, traditional Aristotelian philosophy, the kind you see in writers like Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. So that book is, um, as I say, should be out within a few weeks. Um, And people are interested in either that book or in uh, anything else I've written or in uh, talks of mine that are available online. They can they can find it at my main website. Again, that's edwardfazer.com. My last name spelled F-E-S-E-R, edwardfazer.com. And that'll also give them a link to my blog, which you mentioned, which I try to update regularly. I'm a little behind this week on it because I've got uh, preparation for, for another talk I got to do. But yeah, I, 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 up, I try to update it at least weekly with significant uh, content. And um, they'll find that a link to that from my uh, my main website, my main website as well. If they just Google my name; they'll find both the, both the blog and the website, and lots of other stuff. Beautiful, and I will be sure to link that in the show notes again. Thanks so much for having me. 
We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.